So first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Oscar Mendoza Plasencia. I'm the interim student life supervisor. And uh, thank you for being here. So a little bit about what we're doing today, right? So you're probably wondering, like, OK, you need a day. OK, I'm here. We're all together. What's, uh, what's it about, right? Uh, so I supervise a peer mentor program. And I have 17 amazing, amazing, amazing uh, peer mentors. And one thing that I requested from them this year is to come up with a passion project. So they made groups of three to five students, and they created a passion project. So one of the students, she said, you know what? We need to bring unity in this campus, right? There's a lot of things that happen throughout the world and in, in, in our country, in our backyard, that have um, you know, demonstrated that there's a lot of differences, right? And sometimes we feel like the differences that are between us separate us. But you know what? There's more things that unite us than things that separate us, right? So she started thinking about, we need to do something like this. And this is something that she came up with. Created a, a committee that you know, included faculty, staff, and students. And this is the result of it. So she's been working for, the, uh, for this event for the past almost a year. Yeah. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce you to Mr. Hale Cassie. Hi guys, how you, how you doing? Good. I want to hype up the crowd. Can we get like a whoop whoop thing? <laughs> hey, that's what I'm talking about. So um, my name is Sahel, and I'm a peer mentor, as Oscar said. Um, so let me start with what this day is. So today is what I call Unity Day, and um, I kind of like when you hear it first, it's like kind of sounds cheesy, right? But it's not cheesy, I promise. It's a day that I wanted to make to um, kind of give students a day to debrief about what's going on in society currently, emphasize on current events. Um, I wanted to create like a sort of four to five hour day long, self-contained day where students come in and they, you know, when you guys registered, I'm pretty sure you guys saw the statement on the bottom. And it said that we'll be focusing on sensitive topics, and we're going to focus on like anti-discrimination and talking about things that we don't usually talk about. So today, I want to really focus on opening up with each other. I know that some of you might have friends here, or some of you might not know anyone here. But the whole point is for all of us to open up and understand that there is more stuff that we have in common with one another than we have different. And with everything going on with Stefan Clark, with New Zealand, all heavy, heavy stuff. I want us to be able to talk about it, agree to disagree, have our own opinions, but at the end of the day, understand that it's, it, it doesn't matter. We're all human. We're all here to have an education. We're all here to just thrive. And I was able to make that happen with a really strong committee. I had people like Oscar Mendoza, who was just talked to, um, Amanda Walker from the Printing Services, Christina Washington from the English Department, and Olympia, who uh, works at the Student Life Office, who wasn't able to make it today. Um, and Winnie Lanier, who was the former advisor of the Student Life Office, who is in Italy right now, so I guess she has better plans. But it's fine. It's fine. And I don't take it personally, trust me. Um, and yeah, I... With that committee, I was able to pull us off over the past eight months, and I'm really proud of it. It was a learning experience. It was something that was very new for me, and I went through a lot of obstacles, made a lot of detours, but I am happy with what it turned out to be, and I'm really passionate about this, and I feel, and I hope you guys can feel how passionate I am about this, because I just want us to be happy and love each other and have a good community to thrive in. And I was lucky enough to get the support of our wonderful CRC president, Dr. Bush, who will speak to you now. So please welcome Dr. Bush. Thank you, Sarah. Awesome. Let's give it up for Sarah one more time. Again, thank you for all, your, all of your work. And um, not only your work, thank you for your, your vision um, to pull us together. I think it is indeed um, timely right, that we find ourselves gathered here uh, right now, given some of the things that, um, events that was just 
just mentioned. Um, I'm not going to be long. I'm, I'm only supposed to do um, the welcome, so welcome. Uh, but I thought maybe take a couple of seconds if I can, maybe one or two minutes, uh, to just kind of share some of my general thoughts, right, as it relates uh, to this notion of, 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 of unity. And I had a kind of minute to reflect on reflect on it um, before I talked with you. Uh, you know, it was mentioned that we have more in common than what we have uh, different, and I think that's so very true. Um, but to be different doesn't necessarily mean it's to be, it, that's negative as well. Um, we are living in a time in which our differences are actually being exploited, that is being used as a weapon and as a tool to divide us, there's, that there's a certain amount of appreciation to re in recognizing the differences that we bring in terms of perspectives, in terms of thought, um, in terms of culture, and in terms of uh, experiences, right? That we don't have common experiences, that we all don't have a common story, but the unity or the commonality within that comes from a mutual place of understanding and appreciation of the differences. And often when we come together in the name of unity, um, it seems like we, we have this vibe, right, that unity means that we all have to come together and sing kumbaya. And that unity really starts with this idea of creating, and this is why I appreciate uh, the vision around to today's event, that it comes with the idea that there's, there, that there's some real conflicts, right, that, that, that there's some things going on in, in the world that we need to create some space to be able to discuss and to, to talk about. And we have to understand that unity comes from this notion and idea of justice. When there's a lack of justice, it's very difficult to achieve unity, right? And I learned this lesson. I think I've always known it. I uh, had a chance maybe two years ago to go through this training. So many of our employees of Los Rios Community College District have an opportunity to do what's called uh, IBA training, interest-based approach. And a part of that training, there's this exercise, and I'm not gonna explain the game, but how many of you heard of a game like Prisoner's Dilemma? I mean, that sounds familiar. Like, you know, win, win, lose, lose, win, lose kind of exercise. So the exercise, if you play a card, if you play a certain card, right, and the both teams play a, play a card, neither team, they're separated, they're in different rooms, you don't know which card the other team is gonna play, and they don't know the card you're gonna play. But to say if you all play an A, you all get 10 points, right? But if you play an A and they play a B, you get 20 points and the other team may lose five. But if they play a B and play an A, you may lose points right in their game points. If you follow me? I know I'm not explaining the best, but nod your head if you're kind of getting what I'm saying, right? So the game starts. And so my team plays the B card and they play the A. Right, if we both played A, we both would have got 10 points. We played a B card, so my team got 15 points and they lost five. And in the exercise, they allow you to pull together so you can send one person, a representative for your team, and I was the rep for my team, and they could send one rep for their team. You could discuss how you want to approach the game. So we made a decision that from here on out, we're just gonna continue to play all A's because if we play all A's, then what happens? Everyone gets some points. You might not get the maximum point, right? But you're all going to get some points. And so, sure enough, the next round, we play the A, and they did what? Play the A. Right? Because we, we agreed. They played the A. Next round, what happened? We played the A, and what did they play? Play the A. And so, again, before the last round, you had the opportunity to send representatives. And so this is the last round again, so are we gonna stick to the plan? They said, yes, you could trust me. As a matter of fact, here's $20 just to make sure. And if we end up playing something else, you're gonna keep the 20, but we wanted to make sure that you know that you can trust us and this is how serious we are. So at the end of the round, game on the line, we follow the plan and play an A, and guess what they played? They played a B. So I'm a competitor. I was hot, 
right? They was cracking jokes. I know they were suspecting me to get a $20 back. Like, no, I'm really keeping this $20. I'm like, I'm buying my team pizza. You know, I get, I was, I was hot. I was mad and it was time to share out. So I was prepared to have my speech ready to talk about how unfair and unjust, how we were betrayed in the game, right? That we didn't have the unity that we agreed upon when we all win and that broke that trust. But before I was able to speak, the spirit stopped me and a revelation hit me that I was the wrong one that was wrong. I was the one that betrayed the game and went back on this idea of unity. Now, how did I, how was I the one that betrayed trust? It's because when we made a decision, when we first met, I was comfortable with saying from this point forward, we are going to win together, but I forgot that we were already 10 points ahead. So if we continue to play A's, my team was going to what? End up with what? 10 points extra because we failed to redress how we gained the system in the first place. And so we didn't have a basis or foundation of unity because we already exploited the situation. Does that make sense? And so when we call for unity now, we can't start and say, hey, everything is fine. Everything is good. Let's move forward together and sing Kumbaya. That's impossible because of all the years and history and time of injustice that has not been restored. We haven't made up for that. So you're asking people to come sing Kumbaya and be unified when they're in pain, when they're economically disadvantaged, when we're brutalized. You can't move forward unless you address and restore and make whole everything that was lost. But I was okay with moving forward because I was already ahead. And we're living in a society where there's folks that are already ahead. And it's incumbent on those who are ahead to recognize that they are Ahead and everything that means and everything that that brings you and the privilege that goes along with being ahead. And it's incumbent to say, hey, if we really want to have unity, then I have to give something up. And giving something up is so very hard. <laughs> Sounds good until you don't want to have to give it up. And so today, the conversation that I think that is set up and that what we have to have is not only talking about how we move forward, but how do we move forward in addressing and recognizing, right? Because sometimes you may be ahead, but you may not have something to give up. But what you can, you can acknowledge, you can recognize. And those who are not ahead, you can, you can understand and acknowledge and recognize what it means to, for someone to be for it and don't have anything to give and understand and be able to deal with the trauma and the pain that has been caused by running a race where you started behind in the first place. So today I would challenge us not to just to move forward in a unified fashion, not just that, but it is that. But I want us to move forward with this idea of justice. Move forward with this idea of justice. And come to some agreement of how we can come together collectively to not only recognize the injustice, but use our collective and unified voice, but use our collective and, a collective and unified resources, that we use our collective and unified expertise, knowledge, and education. That we use our collective voice by being similar position as students, as faculty, and as staff. To be able to launch a unified fight. 
to make this world and the society that we live in a more just place, starting with CRC. Because we can't apply to something abstract if we don't apply to the place that you sit right now and where you spend time and resources and money at. So the conversation can't be about how can we make society better without first figuring out how we can make CRC better and hold those in position accountable to ensure that that happens. Thank you, I appreciate it. I'm glad you are here to engage in this important conversation. Thank you, Dr. Bush. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you all feel inspired to make a difference, right? Awesome. Okay, uh, with that said, uh, we also have a lot of different programs on this campus that try to address that, right? One of them is the safe spaces. So in order for us to learn a little bit more about what that safe spaces are and what they can do for us and what you can do for them, we have one of our very own professors, Anastasia Panagakos. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Oscar, for that introduction. Thank you, President Bush, and thank you, Sahel, it's nice to see you, um, for organizing this, and it's nice to see so many familiar faces and some new faces out there in the audience. So um, I'm here just to talk really briefly about our Safe Spaces program. How many of you have heard of it or seen this image before? So a few of you. That's good. So maybe around campus you've seen um, the Safe Spaces sticker either on, on windows or offices, um, maybe on a syllabus. Um, some professors do put them on their syllabi. And I wanted to tell you just a little bit about how this program got started and what it is. Because sometimes we, don't, we see it, but we don't really know what it is or what it can do for us. And about 10 years ago, um, there was a group of faculty here on campus that felt really strongly about making sure that those of us who work here are providing a positive learning environment for all our students. And so we talked about that a little bit. What did it mean to have a positive learning environment? And the idea was that anyone should be able to come to campus from whatever their background was, wherever they're starting from in terms of education um, or, or where they come from, and should feel welcome and included. And we thought about what that meant, and it basically meant that we as faculty would um, make ourselves available to any student on campus, or really anyone in our campus community, who felt that our campus wasn't welcoming. So in other words, our doors are open. So if at any point in time you feel that you um, are experiencing um, a hostile situation, maybe you feel like you've heard something or seen something that's made you uncomfortable, whatever it is, that wherever you see a Safe Spaces sticker, that's a place where you can go in and get help. Whatever that help means. It could just be, and maybe it's just something that was kind of slightly unsettling and you really aren't really sure what to do with it, but you just want to talk it out. And so if you find someone who has a sticker in their window or a professor who says that their classroom is a safe space, that's someone that you can talk to. And, um, you know, because again, not everything requires um, intervention on a higher level, right? Things happen that aren't necessarily rule breaking, but they're things that do make us feel like campus isn't welcoming. And unless students tell us about these things, we don't, we don't really know, right? Because professors can get a little insulated in our brains, right? We're too busy grading, we're too busy trying to manage a classroom. We don't always see everything that's happening around us. So it's good for you to know that um, there are many of us here on campus who want to see CRC uh, an inclusive space, uh, a space that recognizes that we all bring something to the table regardless of where we're coming from, and that above all is respectful of every student's experience. Um, and so what you have in front of you is just, it's a bookmark. So, um, and it has on there our mission statement and then also our Safe Spaces pledge. And uh, if you read over that pledge, um, you'll see it's basically just saying that you, while you're here on campus, that you also buy into this idea and um, will help us promote a positive learning environment so that we all feel welcome. Um, I will leave some buttons in the very back that say I support Safe Spaces. So if you read that pledge, you're more than welcome to take a button and hold on to it. Um, if you'd like to know more about the program, we do have information on the Safe Spaces page on the CRC website, and the um, web address is listed right at the bottom there. And um, my door is always open. I'm over in the SOC building. If anyone knows where that is, kind of tucked away. 
um, blink and you miss it, right? So I'm over there and I'm always here to listen to students and hear what you have to say. And we would love um, more student involvement also. We have the student ambassadors who help us out with um, various programs, but all students are welcome to help us out. Um, one event that we do have coming up that I just want to plug is next week we know is Asian Pacific American Heritage Week. And uh, one thing that we've been working on this semester is helping promote um, and helping our LGBTQ community feel more inclusive here on, or feel more included here on campus. We are lobbying to have a Pride Center established at some point when there's space, because we know that space right now is kind of the big issue. Um, and so we will be tabling um, for two days alongside all the other groups that will be out for um, Asian Pacific American Heritage Week. Come out, we have a big rainbow flag which is an inclusive rainbow flag. It's been redesigned. Uh, we have new buttons and come on out and see what it's about and sign our pledge also to help us uh, support getting a Pride Center on campus. So um, thank you again for hosting this and for putting this together and thank you for listening and have a good day. Thanks everyone. Um, and Oscar um, Sahaligan, uh, for all of their uh, hard work and um, again, and thanking Amanda who's here with us in spirit for finding our presenter who is a Rowdy Duncan. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Rowdy before he starts his presentation. Um, he's worked in the field of diversity and inclusion for over a decade. So that's a quite a long history of peer mentoring. Um, he helps educate youth about drug prevention, educational success in college and career readiness. Um, he is also the director of Paradise Valley Community College's Diversity Incorporated. It's a program that teaches students how to present the Mosaic Inclusiveness Program. And he's an active member of the Healing Racism Public Dialogue Series. And he has a whole bunch of other beautiful things about him. It's really long. And, <laughs> and it's a, a great list of accomplishments. And I'm sure you're eager to uh, hear him speak. But I'll say a couple more things. Um, he sits on the Desperado LGBT film series screening committee. And he produces and delivers his inclusive activism podcast biweekly to thousands of listeners. And his topics include intersections of diversity, inclusion, and equity. So today he's going to share some of those ideas with us. Um, and also to mention, he was the 2014 winner of the Arizona Diversity Alliance's um, Diversity Champion Award. So here's, he is here, he is a subject matter expert. Um, he's held many of these workshops. And so we're gonna hand it over to him and we're gonna have a good conversation. So we learned a little bit about each other. Uh, so you know some people here other than the ones who are in your classroom. So now you get to meet Rowdy. Rowdy, thank you so much, we thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. thank you. All right, good morning everybody, how y'all doing? Good, good. It was really fun to kind of get to talk to you and just interact and not have to be speaker guy at the very beginning. Um, so that was really nice. Uh, I am known as Rowdy Duncan, the human being, right? Um, uh, and I also want to recognize that we're in America, United States of America, right? We're on American soil. I also want to remember that before that, this is Plains Miwok land, right? So there was indigenous folks that had to get kicked out, that had to die for us to be here today. So in honor and respect to them, let's take a moment of silence to just respect the fact that we're on Plains Miwok land and appreciate their contributions to what we did today. Thank you very much. So today, uh, I'm here to talk to you about this big idea, right? Me is greater than we, right? And if me is truly greater than we, then we truly reach this idea called equality. Um, but there's things that get in the way of that. And I'm here to talk to you about the things that get in the way of that so you understand how these things happen because racism, supremacy, classism, sexism, that stuff doesn't come from nowhere, right? Uh, it comes from us because we, t we learn these things over and over again and these things reproduce in all of us. And it's funny, like, oh, just by a raise of hands here, who's woke? Who feels woke? A couple of you, right? If you are woke, be careful because you still make mistakes. We're always awakening, right? Uh, so no, nobody's completely woke. We're just slowly arousing from our slumber. If we eventually understood all diversity issues and problems today, 
we'd make mistakes tomorrow because other people would be new parts of their full selves, right? So understanding that we should be self-critical first really makes a big difference in understanding what we need to know today. So today, um, I'm going to have you talk to each other. I'm going to have you talk to me. Uh, we're going to make this a very interactive dialogue because it's, I know I'm a paid speaker, but it's so much cooler when you all get to talk to each other and get to know one another, as well as me getting to know you as well. So I'm really excited and happy to do so uh, with you today. So what I want you to do is get up and find somebody you don't know at all, okay? And what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you tell them what you believe, what kind of house they live in. So you're going to say, like, I think you live in, I'm going to say, a two-bedroom apartment, not on the ground floor, second floor, uh, and maybe one of those rooms is an office. That's my guess, right? So I'm going to try to be right as possible. But he's not going to tell me at first. I'm going to tell him what I think he is, OK? I'm going to do the same thing for what kind of car they drive. Do they drive a car? What kind of car? Do you take public transportation, right? You want to try to be right. Uh, the other thing is you got to also tell them what kind of pet they own. So remember, when you're answering these questions, if you say snake, Right? There's a there's certain type of like people that are snake people. So you better have some hardcore snake evidence why you feel like that's the case. Because sometimes people are like, snake? Whoa. I'm, I'm not a snake person, man. Or some people are like, yeah, I'm totally a snake person, right? So again, try to be right. And then the other thing that you want to do is name a genre of music that you believe they listen to. So don't, ge don't like... Oh, Top 40, yeah, who doesn't listen to Top 40? It's impossible to miss Top 40. Like, pick a genre of music that, you, that is different that you feel like they actually listen to. So the main thing is don't introduce yourself, don't say your name. It's part of the activity. Just find somebody you don't know, pair up with them, and then you're gonna take some time and answer these questions. Are we clear? Thumbs up if we're clear. We got a question. We'll talk about that. But know that I'm asking you to do this so we can have a discussion about some of those things if they come up, okay? Any other questions? We're clear? All right, go ahead and stand up, find somebody you don't know, and then answer the following questions. I'm gonna give you about five minutes to do so. Real quick, exchange names with your partner and remember your partner, because you're gonna come back to your partner later, okay? Get your partner's name, and make sure you know what they look like because we're going to find them again later in the speech, okay? Give you about 30 seconds to do that. Once you know your partner, you can head back to your seats. All right, so um, one prelude to our conversation. My spaces, I don't really call safe spaces because I don't know that really a for sure safe space exists in the world that I've ever been to. I like to call them brave spaces because when we can be brave, we can be honest, when we can ask the question that we wouldn't want to ask anybody else, we can really understand this stuff and dig in and get to know stuff. So no, if I ask you a question, there's not, wrong, there's not right or wrong answers to it. I'm asking you about your experience. Who here had an experience? Everybody did. Everybody, everybody did. <laughs> you all had an experience. <laughs> all right, so uh, what, just uh, wanna get some hands and then some feedback. What was this experience like for you? Hello? <laughs> how do I do this? Oh, I thought it was like kind of fun to see how like people think what kind of like, you know, all this information about you. Because even like when we first meet someone, we kind of like judge them by their appearance, whether we want it or not. That's just what I feel like everyone does, you know, just like, oh, who are you? But obviously, you know, you should like get to know them first. <laughs> yeah. 
So you kind of enjoyed the experience, but like, because you like to hear the feedback about you, because you don't get to hear it. But it was also a little bit weird because of the judgment thing. You, I mean, getting it, but like maybe the putting it on part. Is that what you were saying? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm asking. Oh, okay. Oh, she got all of them right. It's not awkward if you get them all right. Am I right? Yeah. It was pretty, I think the experience was pretty cool. I mean, I'm not a person who will, this put me out of my comfort zone because I don't like judging people like right off the bat. So like openly being like, oh, this is what I think you are, even though I have no idea. Right. That was kind of scary to do. But it led to a really good conversation and I liked it a lot. Okay, very good. So let me get a, do, let's survey time. Who here was four for four? Raise your hand. Both of you. All right. <laughs> these, two, these two are very observant people. The rest of us, we got work to do, right? Uh, how about three for four? Three for four, hands up. Two or three, okay, a little bit. How about two for four? Raise your hands. Two for four? Okay, a little bit more there. How about only one out of four? Raise your hands. One out of four? That's okay. It's complicated, right? Who is zero for four? I was zero for four too. I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't have the opportunity. So with this, do you think this is something that we do regularly? Yeah? Is it awkward? Well, if I tell you to, it's not so bad, right? Because you're here and the speaker tells you to, it's not so bad, right? Um, but like, I think judgments are something that happens all the time, right? And it's funny because when we talk to folks who are like, I'm free of judgment and I don't, I don't judge people, I'm like, oh, wow, you are an enlightened being. You are way beyond me. I wish I could get to that level, but I'm not there yet. I'm just more aware of my judgments, right? Because sometimes I think some messed up stuff, right? I just am honest about the messed up stuff that I think. Because when I have that thought, I'm like, what? What? Where did, that, where did that horrible sexist thought come from? Or I'm like, where did that horrible racist thought come from? Because it comes, right? It happens from time to time if we're going to be honest with ourselves. This activity is to help you understand judgments happen. And we have to understand that judgments happen in order to understand what the judgments do to us. So what I need to do next is I need to talk about some terms and definitions so I can help you understand what your brain does when you meet people so you can watch your brain and be more aware of your judgments, okay? So first thing is a big word that seems incredibly complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. It's called mental heuristics. It means your brain's trying to figure out, am I about to die right now or not? That's your first and foremost primary concern in your brain at all times, right? I seem like a nice person, yeah? So, like there was a real big delay there. I was like, okay, well, maybe I need to work on my friendliness. Um, but I seem like a nice, pretty trustworthy person. Say I, I bring a bear in, though. Are you going to be like, well, he seems nice enough. It's a bear. Are you going to head for the door? <laughs> of course you're going to head for the door, right? Because you're trying to stay alive. In every situation, you're trying to sit, stay alive, and that's what your brain wants to do. Part of the reason why you who sits in the same chair in most classes? You know why you do that? is because you feel like it's safer there. Where was the threat? <laughs> I know where the door is from here. Congratulations. Good on you. Maybe like try a different spot, get to know different people, right? Um, but our brain wants to do that thing. So being aware that our brain wants to do that thing is really important. The next thing is our brain wants to have generalizations. It's a belief for our understanding that uh, results from a pattern identified through one or more experiences, right? So these are ideas, like, so some of the generalizations are just the, the desserts you enjoy, right? Oh, I really like cupcakes, right? And then someone's like, hey, here's baklava, and you're like, baklava, what? Cupcakes, right? Who's had warm, fresh baklava? Oh, buttery, flaky goodness in your mouth. It was funny, I was going to the cupcake table once and someone was like, no, you need to eat this baklava. And I'm like, but there's a cupcake over right here. And they're like, no, eat it. And I'm like, God, oh, fine. You're the diversity guy, you're supposed to eat it. And I tasted it and it was amazing. But like you have to step outside of your experiences to have that different outcome, right? Uh, and then the next thing that leads me to a big area that I wanna talk about is called bias, right? So you are biased about everything. Like everything. 
Like if, and it's funny because you may not even be aware of it. If I said, hey, do you want this chair? You would be like, yeah or no. But you probably didn't know you had a bias about it till I offered it to you. And then you're like, yeah, that seems like a good chair. Or you're like, no, nothing matches. I'm not interested in it. So understanding what bias is and how bias works is really important because we have opinions about everything that isn't truly unknown. Truly unknown things, we give a pretty fair shot as long as it's not going to kill us. Otherwise, bias really gives us a sense of uh, how we see, shape, and understand the world. Okay? So there's two types of bias. And when we think about bias, that's usually how people think about racism, right? When we think of racism, we think of racist, right? Like racist Joe, who I've never met, right? But like, we're like, you're a racist, or that's racist, right? There's not, in my experience, a lot of people that are like clearly just racist. I would say people that identify as racists are. Like if you're like, I'm racist, I'd be like, okay, well, I believe you. <laughs> right? Because you self-identify. Everybody else, I think, is affected by racism, right? So they're not thinking that they're trying to do this thing on pur purpose. They're affected by the things that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. So no, usually when we're talking about ism, most people aren't trying to be that thing on purpose. They were taught something, they were said something, they watch TV shows and media, because all that stuff can be really toxic and problematic, right? Sometimes we really like that stuff, though, don't we? Let's be honest. You watch some shows, you're like, I know I shouldn't watch that show. But I really like that show. Like Game of Thrones, like there's like rapes, like seriously, like every five minutes. And you still watch that show. I still watch that show. Right? You got to be honest with yourself. What does it do? How does that stuff make an impact with us over time? So again, explicit bias, super easy to understand. The next thing that I want to talk about is much more complicated, as you could tell, because I had to like reduce the type size quite a bit. It's called implicit bias. This is the bias we're not aware of. This is the bias of the chair. When I'm like, do you want the chair? You're like, mm, yeah, or mm, no. You weren't aware of your chair bias until I made you aware of your chair bias. This is the things that we see, the patterns that come up over and over and over again. So it affects our understandings of the world, our actions, our decisions in a very unconscious manner. It's not until someone shows you these things and makes you aware of this stuff that you become aware of this stuff. So knowing about this, it's really important to know that it's very pervasive. Again, you have an implicit bias about almost everything. And it's funny because societally, uh, you can have a bias against yourself. Did you know that was possible? Like over time, you see stuff and you think you're supposed to reproduce a pattern in a certain way, right? Men are supposed to be tough and strong. I don't remember the last time I needed to be tough and strong on a Tuesday, <laughs> right? It doesn't actually come up that often. Last time I was in a fight was like fourth grade. But still, I was supposed to be ready for a fight at all times. What a waste of time, right? Um, these are the implicit and it, implicit and explicit bias are related mental constructs, but not mutually exclusive. That means you can say one thing and actually have an implicit bias in the other direction, but you don't know because you haven't been aware. So becoming aware is a big important part of what this is. Um, they also don't necessarily align with our declared beliefs, right? So you see that stuff sometimes when people, they're like, I am pro-life, right? They're like, I think babies should be born. I'm really a big fan of that, right? And then you ask folks, okay, once the baby's born, do you want to help that baby live a good, happy life? Oh, I don't want to pay for that, but I want to see the baby born. You see how that bias works in that way, right? You're, you're pro-life, but then you don't want to pay for life, right? So understanding how bias works and sometimes it counteracts declared beliefs are really important to know. And then the last thing is these implicit biases Always favor the people that look like you over and over again because that's what you see, that's what you're comfortable with. Have you heard that, that the saying, all blank looks the same? They all look the same. I can't tell the difference. Or when someone's like, you look like this person. You're like, no, they're just black too. We don't look anything alike. We're just both black, right? That comes from that in-group bias where people just see the same thing over and over and it works uh, both directions, right? Sometimes folks that 
uh, grow up in communities of color and then they're exposed to white folks, they're just like, I don't know, it's just another white person. Like they had a red sweater on, that's all I remember. Because they're not used to identifying the patterns that are different from what they expect to see. So, I'm gonna show you this thing. So, over and over and over again, when we think about pilots, this is what we see. How many black African American pilots do you think there are in America? No, there is some. Do you think it's thousands? Seventy-three. That's enough to know everybody's name. And you know why that is? Is because when you Google pilot, these are what these guys look like. Over and over again. It was funny, I had a friend who had an implicit bias. And every time we wanted to fly, he would say, okay, I gotta go, I wanna fly, but I gotta check in the cockpit and I'm gonna make sure that I got a good pilot. I was like, what's, what's a good pilot look like? This person was thinking of this idea. Let me ask you a quick question. Are these fellas probably pilots? No, they're actors. Paid to look like pilots. So they're not even actually pilots, right? But because we see the thing over and over again, it really starts to shade the way that we see the world and shade our expectations over and over and over again. Part of the reason why it's so hard to get diversity into certain new spaces is because we haven't seen people do or be those things before, right? So when the pattern looks like this, it keeps pointing to the same thing over and over and over again. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and move into a few more definitions, and then I'm gonna share a personal story that you promise you have to not hold against me, uh, because all this diversity stuff is tricky, and you can't do it perfect, and people are gonna judge you sometimes, but you have to live your life too, and you have to find your happy medium between those things. So a few final terms, stereotypes. These are positive or negative set of beliefs about an individual or the characteristics of a certain group that are very resistant to change, even in the face of contradictory behavior. So what are some stereotypes you've heard about pit bulls? Just go ahead and yell them out. Aggressive, violent, what's that? Killers, what else? Loyal, what else have you heard? Untrainable. So all these things are biases we hear about pit bulls. Now I'm going to tell you a story and I'm going to self-disclose because, again, this diversity stuff gets complicated. So monitor your bias as I tell you about my dog. Okay? I have a dog at home, and I'm always super afraid to share this part because I have to tell you about her name. Her name is Titties. Is Titties. And right now you might be like, okay, diversity guy. Why'd you name your dog Titties? <laughs> should, we call, should we call public safety? <laughs> Is he supposed to be here? So part of the reason why, when you understand why I named her that, it makes a lot more sense, right? So when I found Titties, she was running around the neighborhood. She was very skinny, incredibly emaciated, very thin, hadn't been loved on in a long time, and had just had puppies, but she was way too young. And those puppies passed away. Right? So she's running around full of milk because nobody's there to drink the, the milk. And she's lost. She's scared. She doesn't know what's going on. So we open the door and we're like, come on in, girl. And she comes in. And so we have to take her to the vet. The vet looks at her and they're like, hey, she's in rough shape. You need to get her some antibiotics so she can reabsorb the milk. And then also you can tell, right, the milk and her breasts are really stretching like her skin there. So some of the, there's like cuts and scars and stuff there. So we got to take her back. We got to take care of her, right? And so as I'm doing this, I'm sitting down with this dog with this no name, right? And she sits down and she lays there and I'm like, come here, girl. And I got to put this salve on your titties. And I'd put the salve on her titties and she'd look up and she'd be like, yeah, you're a good, I like you. You're nice. I'd be like, you're poor titties. And she'd be like, yeah, she'd wag her tail, right? So I'm saying these words, these things to her and she starts to get excited, right? And then we, I found out she likes to play, loves to play. Um, and so when we'd play, she loved when I'd get down on the ground and play with her and wrestle with her. Uh, and so when that would happen, I found she also really liked to stand right over my face, 
which was problematic, right? Because I was like, oh, no, your titties are in my face. Oh, goodness, right? Um, and she would get excited because she heard that word again, right? And that word meant love. That word meant play. So every time she heard the word, she'd get excited, right? And so that's the reason why my dog has the name Titties, even if that seems weird. Now understand, I'm not sexually objectifying my dog, right? She's just a little girl that needed some help with her titties because she had babies that didn't stay and she needed a home that loved her, right? Now when you hear that story, it doesn't sound so bad, right? Um, now by a show of hands, if I said Titties is just outside, who wants to meet her? Who would want to meet my dog? Right? Yeah. It's interesting how the bias changes when you hear the story. She's still a pit bull. Right? So thinking about how we see the world and how it's presented to us makes a really big difference. Right? Because even if pit bulls are bad, Titty seems really nice. She's the exception. You see? She's the good one. She's the respectable one. She acts right. You heard those terms before? See how those stereotypes work? Very insidious how they work. And understanding that's really important. So stereotypes lead to prejudice. Uh, who's heard of breed-specific legislation? A couple people? Those are bans against pit bull type dogs in apartments, housing, things like that. Uh, at, at my house, I have to get special insurance just for my dog that's never done anything to anybody. But because I experienced the prejudice, uh, there's sometimes discrimination. That's the unfair treatment towards an individual or group based on their identities. So the discrimination is the breed-specific legislation that says you can't bring your dog in certain spaces, right? Discrimination happens everywhere, too. Who's your teachers and what do your teachers look like? Who's there? Who's not there? This is how the results trickle down through a system over time. So... Now you understand what your brain does. So your brain wants to work in categories and put people in categories. It wants to move through heuristics to generalizations, to bias, then to stereotype, then to prejudice, and then to discrimination. Because your brain likes to know what's next. I can prove that to you too. You know why you laugh? Is because you see an interruption in a normal pattern, and then your brain's like, hey, that doesn't make any sense. And you go, ha 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 ha, I'm so smart. It's a reward for that thing. It's understanding that this thing doesn't make sense and it's breaking the pattern. So it's a reward for seeing a break in the pattern. And if you don't watch your brain, your brain will take you to, I just wanna stay alive, to you don't belong here real fast. It happens to all of us. And knowing that slippery slope is there is very important. Does that make sense? Can I explain anything else to anybody that, that like, maybe has some questions about what that is or how it works? So, so, as a public speaker, this is one of the things I need. Yeah, no, we're good. Or it's like, no, no, no. Or you'd be like, I don't know. Let me try it again. You'll feel like you understand. You know what's going on? Yeah. There we go. All right. I'm a big fan of consent. So don't just, like, do the silence is consent thing with me. That's a whole other conversation. But I don't want to do that. All right? So, moving forward, what can we do about this? So, remember the person that you talked to with before? We're gonna get together with that person and then another pair, and we're gonna take part in this activity. You're gonna tell about the story of your name. So I'm gonna tell you my name story. I'm indigenous, I'm Taos Pueblo, and I'm also Cherokee, and then some Hispanic and some white, but it's hard to tell the numbers because it gets complicated. Um, measuring your whateverness is a very white person idea. It's not a like colored person idea, because you know, you're like, hey, you're us, you belong to us, right? So my name is, I have three ways I tell the story of my name. The first one is uh, I was really active in the womb and I weighed 13 pounds. I know. My mom only weighed 98 pounds. I know. Poor thing. It's this giant baby. You think I'd be a bigger person. Uh, so the second way I tell my name is that people will say, like, you must be really rowdy. And I'm like, well, it depends, you know. But, I'll be, but if I'm just trying to check out, I'll be like, yeah. Yep, really rowdy. I probably scared all my teachers. Could you imagine? Rowdy Duncan. Oh my God. This is going to be the longest year. Uh, the real story of my name is my full name is Rowdy Sunray of the Good Morning. 
That's my indigenous name altogether, right? Uh, because in my culture, you take the last name of your godfather. My godfather's name was Tell Us Good Morning. So I'm Rowdy Sunray of the Good Morning. So I'm supposed to be that little light that like wakes you up, okay? So that's the story of how I got my name. How would you define yourself? Now, when you define yourself, try to define yourself without labels. It's hard. So what I would say is I'm trying to be a good person. Like Mr. Bush, uh, President Bush said earlier, I try to fight for justice. I try to go in places and make a difference for folks. I love seeing when people unify and understand the humanness of one another. That's one of the things that really turned me on. I engage in service because I feel like service is one of the very few things that allow us to see the humanity in each other in really positive ways. If you ever doubt your self-worth, if you get dumped and you're like, poor me, go feed somebody that's hungry. You're going to feel so good about who you are and the difference you can make. It's ridiculous. And if you go on a first date, go feed some people that are hungry. If your partner complains, next. Don't stay with them, right? If they're not touched by the humanity they experience, it's a really great way to weed out folks and find somebody that you're worth, uh, that's worthwhile for other people. Um, then I'm going to describe a time that I have been treated in a biased way. So uh, Amanda Walker, she is really good friends with my, uh, my best friends, Ryan and Michael Walker. We went to high school in the same city. Uh, we went to high school in Wausau, Wisconsin. And so not a lot of brown people in Wausau, Wisconsin. And I used to be much browner when I had a lot more hair, right? But I used to really stick out. And so I would be around shopping. And I would go around and people would be like, hey, can I help you with something? No, I'm okay. Just browsing. Um, are you looking for something specific? No, no, I'm, I'm just browsing. The clearance aisle's over here. Ooh, thanks. I wasn't asking about where the clearance aisle was. But they would follow me all over the place. I got the best customer service in Wisconsin because I had eyes on me the entire time. Right? The assumption was I was going to steal stuff. Now, just between you and me, don't tell Amanda. She's not here. Those boys stole more stuff <laughs> than I could have ever asked to back in the day. Right? But it didn't look like the pattern they expected to see. I was being treated in a biased way. Now, the other one's a lot harder, and it takes a lot more honesty. It's describe a time you treated somebody else in a biased way. So I used to be an advisor before I became a professor. Who here has, a, has had a really great advisor? Yeah? Woot for the, for the really good advisors, right? Give you the good professors, put your degree together, makes a big difference, right? Super helpful to have a good advisor. What do you like? What are you interested? What do you want to learn? What do you want to do someday? Right? Change your life, advisors. That was me. But I noticed when I was with my advisor, my friend pointed out, they said, you know, you, you don't take as long with students when they bring their children. And I was like, yeah, like it feels like it's boring for the kids. And they're like, huh. So Rowdy, your mom, she was a single mom, right? I was like, yeah. It's like, so imagine your mom's going back to school and you get to sit with a good advisor, but they don't take as long because you brought your kid. What would that have done to your family? Oh. That was a tough moment because I realized I had a bias, and it was prejudicing someone that really needed someone to make a difference for them, right? And in that moment, I saw what I was doing wrong and how I could make a difference, right? So like I said, you're going to get together in groups, and I want you to tell the story of your name. How do you define yourself? Describe a time when you've been treated in a biased way, and to try, uh, describe a time when you treated somebody else in a biased way. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes, and then we're going to get back together, okay? Go ahead and get up. Find your partner and then find two other people and go through these questions as quickly as you can. So come on back over. So real quick, of the two different experiences, which one did you enjoy more? This one, right? It's funny because your, your body language is different. The way you like talk to and see, you're like this with each other. You're like, yeah, yeah. Like the connection is just like vibing off you so much, right? Because you're seeing each other, right? And also, this last question, that ain't a fun question to answer, is it? Right? But if I can be honest about the spaces I make mistakes, it gives everybody else the opportunity to be honest too, right? 
Because nobody does this perfect. This is a mess, right? But what do we usually do? One or two, the first or second one? What do we most often do when we meet new people? Do we do the first activity or do we do the second? The first. Think of the amazing, beautiful people you met just because I asked you to talk to each other. Did you know that's always available to you? It's right there. Remember when we were kids? You want to be best friends? Yeah? Yeah? (laughs) Let's do this. If we did that now, people would give us sideways glances. What? Best friends? I don't, I don't know. I don't got time for a new friend. What? You don't have time for a new friend? Oh, that sounds so lonely. Right? Because people are opportunities. Every single person you meet is somebody that could bless your life in a way you don't even know. But all the time we're like, I don't know. I don't got time for a new friend. I'm busy. Busy. Too busy to live? Too busy to connect? You know, I hear sometimes, because I go and do this a lot, sometimes people meet and make their best friend in this activity. And it's only because I gave them the, the excuse and responsibility of asking them to talk. You gotta remember, we're human beings. We are very social creatures, right? Like, I'm big and tough looking, right? But if that bear came in, who are you going to put your money on? Rowdy or the bear? The bear. You put the money on the bear. But I also made some friends today, right? And if it's us versus the bear, yeah, bear doesn't have anything on us, right? Bear stays at home because we ask it to, because we're social creatures. We belong together. And understanding this idea, this we is greater than me, is so important. And, and when you tell people about this, some people are going to go, well, I don't want to join you, okay? The truth works the other direction, too. If you don't want to join us, you're going to be less than us as well. Now, that doesn't mean I don't want you to join because we'll be better with you, right? Because we're always better together. There's no human being that deserves to be shunned or shamed. Shunned, shame, that's violence. Violence is the reason why we have these problems. Sometimes it's emotional violence, sometimes it's spiritual violence, but it's because we're alone. Anybody ever feel like they're alone and nobody understands them? Nobody gets you? People just look at you and expect something, right? Nobody got you when it's the the bad, difficult time? We feel like that sometimes, right? You know why we feel like that? Because we don't talk about that we feel like that. If people knew you were lonely, they knew you needed connection, you got people in your life that would reach out to you, but you don't say nothing. You suffer in silence. You stay separate, right? Remember, we are so much better together. I need you just as much as you need me. I mean, I got the microphone and the title of speaker today. I don't know anything more than you do. I have more practice, maybe, but I'm no leader. I'm walking in the same direction I want you to walk, too. I'm just a little bit in a different place on the path. We're all going to the same place, but we got to shun this, this judgment stuff, this bias stuff, and when you see it, ask questions about it. When somebody says something and you don't know what to say, just say this. What do you mean by that? Is that challenging? No. Is that call somebody out? No. Calling out somebody doesn't help anything. I just called you out. Now they're gone. They're not part of we, are they? What do you need to do when people make a mistake? You need to do the opposite. Call them in. Hey, what you're doing is keeping you separate from us. Let me tell you why. Let me bring you back into the fold, right? We is important. Understanding what we can do together is important. And knowing that you are just as powerful in making this difference as I am is crucial. Because I get to come to CRC today. I got to fly out. I got to go home to titties. (laughs) I I said that once and I didn't tell the story. And one of my students was like, yeah. (laughs) I was like, 
I mean, I had the same reaction, but for incredibly different reasons, right? Because uh, I was excited to see her too. Um, but it's your responsibility to carry this forward for me. Connect to people. Don't sit in the same chair. It's okay. You're going to be all right. Ask people some questions. Get to know folks. Think about it. Everybody in your class is trying to pass. Imagine if everybody in your class was as committed as you are to you passing. You think you'd pass? I think you'd all get A's. Remember, you're not in this alone. Reach out to somebody. It can make all the difference in the world. And with that, I want to invite you to stay connected with me, connected to the cause. Uh, remember that I have the Inclusive Activism Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play. Uh, make friends, meet folks, call people in. And remember, that's the goal. And unite and come together. And I want to give a special round of applause to this very special person that helped make this day spot possible. Um, would you mind coming back up for me? It's super, no, you're, you have to stand by me because you, you are more powerful than me. You made this happen. I just happened to be here today. All it is is a series of small choices. She made a series of small choices day in and day out, and that's what brought us together to hear this message. You have this capacity and power too. And if you're not sure you can make it, I found somebody here that does, right? Connect and understand we have the power to make incredible differences and know what that can do for all of us. And with that, I thank you so much for today, and we'll go ahead and pivot on to our next activity. Thank you.